So I'm going to go ahead and try to get this done in, in 15 minutes. So it's going to be really zipping through. And I decided to title it the top 10 important things about osteoporosis that many doctors don't know. And I don't have any conflicts. So the first is that too much vitamin D causes bone loss. And I still am seeing a lot of patients who come to me on very high doses of vitamin D. Okay? Yeah. Um, and so I want to emphasize that the normal levels are 20 to 50 nanograms per mil. And this is a study that was done in Hawaii. Young, healthy surfers um, get plenty of sun, which is the natural way. And you'll note that the median is 30. So half of the healthy surfers are between 20 and 30. But the Quest and LabCorp um, lab results state that it should be 30 to 100 nanograms. And they do that to increase their profits and not because that's the normal range. And so a lot of doctors think that their patients who are just in the same range as these healthy surfers um, have low vitamin D and they put them on too much. The dose that is needed to achieve a normal level is 800 units a day in people older than 70 and 600 in people who are younger than that. And unless you have some serious problem with your intestine or your liver, this would be the dose you need. So okay. what happens if you take too much? Well, there's three randomized trial already in elderly women showing that yeah. high doses of vitamin D resulted in high uh, levels of hip fracture. Is somebody's phone on? Okay. I think we're set now. All right. And then there was a recent Canadian study that showed um, I think that um, after three years, there was more bone loss with 4,000 units a day compared to 400. And finally, the very recent bio study of 2,000 units a day. I'm just messing. There we go. The, the Zoom is taking over some of my screen. But you can see, you're not seeing the, the pictures, right? You're just seeing the whole screen? Yes, Okay. we're seeing the air slide. Okay, um, 2,000 units a day versus placebo for seven years, and there was no benefit to fracture rates, no matter how they looked at it. So give your patients this low dose. Um, number two, denosumab discontinuation is dangerous. And this is still advertised on TV. A lot of times I see patients coming in whose doctors have just started it without seeming to realize this. So here's the first study of major study of denosumab that was a randomized trial for three years. The red lines, the line of people who started out on denosumab, the blue lines were placebo. You can see the difference after three years. At this point, it became open label and these people all got switched over to denosumab. So they went up and after 10 years, they all stopped and you can see this very rapid decrease in the spine and even more so in the hip. And with this very rapid decrease, we're seeing a complication that we haven't seen with any other medicine, which is that the, um, you, you can get multiple vertebral compression fractures. And um, let me move this around again. Okay, well, that's better. Um, so so um, there's a higher risk of this, and you can see this person just skipped one dose of her medicine. And a few minutes after, I mean, a few months after she was supposed to get it, there's all these new fractures. And there's a report that um, if you do vertebroplasty, it's particularly disastrous. And in 12 women, they had 58 new vertebral fractures in the following days after this procedure. Um, and we think we know why this might happen. There's a new cell that's just been described and the name of this is called an osteomorph and it's related to the osteoclast. So normally we have pre-osteoclasts which are single nuclei turn into osteoclasts when there's rank ligand and then they undergo apoptosis. But if there's inhibition, inhibition of rank ligand, 
instead of undergoing apoptosis, they actually fission and break off into little cells with one nucleus each. These are what we call osteomorphs now. And as soon as denosumab wears off, they will uh, join and form a osteoclast very rapidly, all set to go and start resobrine bone. And these accumulate with duration of denosumab. Okay. And what we found is that um, even zolendronate is, is able to attenuate the loss a little, but it doesn't stop it. So here's one study of a group of patients who'd been on denosumab for seven years, and then they gave them IV zolendronate, and they still got some bone loss. And as you can see here at, at the uh, hip, they, they went back down to lower than normal. So if you have started anybody on denosumab, I think now's the time to get them off and you're going to have to use a bisphosphonate to prevent them from rebounding down to lower than they started. And I'm not recommending it. In our clinic, we've stopped uh, initiating uh, denosumab. Okay, um, number three, a weight loss causes bone loss. And this is just something I would like to remind you all because I get people coming into my clinic with a body mass index um, in the you know, 18 range and their doctors can't figure out why they're having a low bone density or why they're getting fractures. And you can see the curve here is really steep. So even within the normal range, a person with a body mass index of 20 is twice as likely to break her hip as one who's at 25. And then it goes up even steeply after that. So one of the first things we do for a lot of my women is encourage them to try to gain weight. Okay, number four, the T-scores don't transfer between skeletal sites. And I've been seeing a lot of uh, doctors who are looking, they're measuring the bone density at three places and looking for the lowest T-score that they can in order to decide whether to treat. And this is going to really very drastically increase the number of people who would be treated. And I just want to show the example of an 80-year-old woman. So this would be this, this is the little graph right from the bone density machines of the um, radius site where the average person is in this line and losing about 25% as she gets to be 80. And here's the total hip. Again, the average woman loses 25%, but the standard deviation in the reference population is different. So when you age, you lose more standard deviations, not more bone, just more standard deviations. So let's, let's look at this 80 year old and we look at her average, this average woman has now got a T-score for more, about minus three, whereas at her hip, the same woman has a T-score of minus two. So what I'm seeing is women who um, have a hip replacement. And so their doctor's been following the bone density and it's about minus two, which is not needing treatment. And she gets her hips replaced and so you can't measure it anymore. So they get an arm instead. And all of a sudden she's minus three. And you know her doctor thinks, oh my goodness, she's doing terribly. She's lost a lot in the last, in the last year and they start her on drugs and she really hasn't lost anything. So really keep that in mind, you can't transfer them. Also, this is the last other thing, if you, if you did follow, follow the two and a half rule, that's the average bone density for 75 year old. So you would treat half of all the women who are 75, which is way more than you need to. Okay, number five. Uh, limit bisphosphonate use to five years because long-term use increases the risk of fractures. And this is especially in Asians. So um, I, I know a lot of you have uh, heard me talk about this before. Um, this was actually a study I did. And the duration of bisphosphonate use will predict rate of these atypical fractures as shown in, in one of our patients here. So, so during the first five years, they're relatively low rates, but these really do start to zoom up after five years. 
And we don't know why, but it's been shown several times that Asians are now five times more likely to have these kind of fractures. But the other reason that you stop for five years is because the bisphosphonates are not effective after five years, even in patients with a high fracture risk. And I have to show this because it is misquoted all the time. I think every major journal has misquoted it and the guidelines say, well, after five years, you can stop alendronate if they have a low fracture risk, but if they have a high fracture risk, you need to keep them on it to prevent getting more fractures. But here is the data reported by the FDA who is not biased by the drug company. So this was the study where um, women had all taken alendronate for five years. That's when the study started. And there were a thousand of them. They were randomized into three groups. The placebo group is in green two different doses of alendronate. And for five years, you can see that the green line is just the same as the other lines. But then they did the same analysis only in the ones who had osteoporosis um, with the T-score lower than minus two and a half. And again, there's no benefit. So for, for the next five years, you're gonna have just as many fractures if you take the drug as if you don't. So it's not necessary to take it. Okay, number six, um, if possible, calcium should be formed from food, except for spinach, with an intake of about 700 to 1200 milligrams a day. That's a little lower than we used to recommend. It's in line with the um, United Kingdom recommendations for osteoporosis, and the 1200 is what the um, current United States recommendation is. But a lot of doctors just give pills give supplements automatically without even asking what they eat. Whereas we try to get them to eat and only give pills if it's really necessary. And um, pointing out that spinach has a lot of calcium in the leaf, but none of it gets absorbed. Okay, number seven. Even asymptomatic vertebral fractures are important. So, this is a new technique called vertebral fracture assessment, um, which I'm also kind of maybe promoting because you can get a view while you get your DEXA and it will pick out the moderate and severe uh, fractures as shown here at T8 and T11. Now there's quite a few studies that show that women with a vertebral fracture are four times more likely to have a future fracture than women with the same age and the same bone density. So it's one of the strongest reasons to give drugs that we, that we have. And you can't just ask if she's had a fracture because you will be wrong many times. So the NHANES survey uh, included vertebral fracture assessment on their last wave. And they also did a questionnaire and what they found was only 8% of the ones with the spine fracture that you could see on the x-ray, had a history of a spine fracture by their questionnaire. And on the other hand, among those who reported a spine fracture on the questionnaire, only 21% actually had a fracture. So they had more uh, muscle and ligament injuries. Other studies and observational studies, only 40% of women with a new vertebral fracture had mentioned any symptoms. And in placebo groups of major clinical trials of osteoporosis, those with a new fracture seen on the x-ray have a 20% chance of another new fracture within a year. And this is even if they didn't have symptoms. So these fractures can be slow and not so painful, but they're, they're really important signs. So if you can find one, you, you should be treating it with a osteoporosis prevention drug. Okay, number eight. Estrogen improves bone mass as well or better than bisphosphonates. So these are all old studies because they were done before the Women's Health Initiative. We're now more cautious about using estrogen in elderly women, but these four studies were done. These were women with established osteoporosis, postmenopausal women, elderly women, and osteoporosis. And in every case, the improvement in bone density was, was very similar between estrogen and the bisphosphonates. And the final study was done in women who were 40 to 60 years old and perimenopausal. 
And in this study, there was a significantly better improvement in estrogen, as you can see on the graph, over the four years, and compared to the um, alendronate group. Um, and furthermore, the, some of the physiology of the bone is more natural and the bone quality is superior with estrogen. So a lot of doctors somehow have a feeling that the bisphosphonates are better or stronger. And um, this is just because of the successful advertising of Merck. Okay, number nine. This is really new. This has just been published about a month ago. Um, one dose of zledronate prevents bone loss for a decade. So these um, investigators from New Zealand um, had a group of women and they randomly gave um, a single dose of five milligrams or placebo and then just followed them for 10 years looking at bone density. And here's what you can see, it went up in the spine and gradually, finally, after 10 years, came back down to the baseline. And this was the placebo group where they showed a steady loss. And uh, the hip showed the same pattern here. And then what, it, what they also did, it's very interesting, is in another group, they gave these tiny doses, um, just one milligram or two milligram, two and a half. And look at these black squares. The, the bone density went up almost as much with one milligram as it did here with five milligrams. And it lasted, it didn't last as long, but it still lasted five years. And we saw the same thing at the hip, and then they gave another dose at this arrow and, and got the same pattern. And at the total hip, here's the placebo group just showing the you know, loss that we see. But the total hip went up on one milligram. I mean, this study, I think, really questions whether we're giving way too much um, medication and that we could perhaps get by with um, low doses as low as one milligram. And also, it's not at all necessary to give selenonate every year. Um, it's already approved for every two years by the FDA for osteoporosis. And I tend to give it for two years or two years after I give a dose, I'll check the NTX. And if it's low, I won't even give it until the NTX starts going down. And um, I think in the future, we're gonna use a lot less alendronate. Okay, and the final one, this is also brand new and um, actually really fascinating. So butyrate, which is generated in your, in, in your intestine from bacteria, that are found in yogurt and it increases bone formation. Now these studies were done in mice, but they're fascinating. So here's the bacteria. So in the, in the gut microbiota, these will change carbohydrates into butyrate, which is a short chain amino acid. It gets absorbed and it goes to your bone marrow where it interacts with all these immune cells. So First, the dendritic cell goes to the CD4 cell, goes to the T regulatory cell, to the CD8 T cell, and in a chain of reactions which ends up with what we call WIMT. And some of you might have heard about the WIMT signaling pathway. That is really necessary for osteoblasts to form uh, from the progenitor cells. So WIMT will activate WIMT signaling and increase your osteoblastic bone formation. And in addition, it's necessary to have butyrate for parathyroid hormone to um, cause an anabolic reaction on the bone. So those are my 10 facts. And I think I've pretty much stayed on time. So I'll just end up with this one little slide to say that romososumab, which is also something that inhibits, that inhibits the inhibitor of WENT signaling. So this also increases WENT signaling and it gives a, a beautiful improvement in bone density that we can maybe talk about later. And I'm now, I guess, ready for um, questions. <laughs>